For today, we are going to talk about the psychological perspective in understanding the self. So let's begin. First, let me define what psychology is. So psychology is the scientific study of human behavior and mental processes. So in psychology, we study how people think, what people think, what people learn, and how can we change what we have learned, okay? How do people develop? How do people form relationships? How do people cope through different adversities in life? How do mental health flourish? And how does mental illness develop? We learn, um, we try to scientifically study these things so that we can understand more about human behavior. Like why do people help? and why are people less likely to help and there are a lot of issues under psychology such as gender such as teaching such as thinking discrimination beliefs etc okay and here are the four goals of psychology in psychology we aim to describe explain predict and modify behavior whenever we encounter people and these people turn out to be our clients whenever we interact with clients we try to apply these four goals so the first is describe so if we have a client say for example you have been sent to the guidance office or you have been seeing a psychologist the first thing that we try to do is to describe what is happening with you so why are you here in the guidance office do you have behavioral problems or are you here out of your own free will or did someone tell you to be here and if you're here why are you here okay did you do something that your parents dislike okay did you do something that is alarming okay so we try to describe what the person is doing and this does not only happen with our clients we try to use this in our everyday life Say, for example, if a certain student is doing good, then we try to describe in what aspects of what he's trying to study is he or she doing good, okay? Is he good in mathematics? And then after we describe, we try to explain what makes this person different in comparison to others. Now, we use the different theories of psychology to try to understand and explain why the person turns out to be like that now why is this person so spoiled and behaves in a childish manner even though that he or she is an adult then we try to come in with our possible explanations like we can link that to his childhood behaviors we can link that to his past experiences or we can link that to future um, possible future goals okay we can explain your dominance or your excellence in mathematics or in whatever field that you excel in as something related to your goal of becoming what you want to be. Say for example, if you are very good in arts, then I can explain that's because you dream of having a good career in arts. And with after the description and the explanation, we try to predict what is going to happen with the person but I want to clarify that we don't predict exactly what will happen to you I'm not going to say that later you're going to talk with your mother and here's what you're going to say word by word no that's not what psychology is okay we try to to change that misconception we don't guess what will happen to you but rather we use um, we make scientific guesses we make hypothesis we try to predict what is going to happen with a person based on his past experiences say for example we can predict if you're going to behave or if you're going to disrupt the class based on your past experiences we can predict if a student will continually be absent based on the past events if you have been absent for four four meetings in a row then we can predict that what if that we can predict that your absence may continue in the next few weeks hence after predicting what is going to happen as psychology professionals or in your understanding as mental health professionals here's where we come in when we try to modify the behavior that's why when we predict that a person will continually be bothered by a certain mental concern mental illness 
concerned in mental health, we now modify the behavior by trying to apply some interventions. Okay, that can be therapy, that can be training, social skills training, and we try to intervene in various ways so that even though we predict that the behavior or the person will continue to worsen, we can somehow act early and put a solution to the to the problem that the person is experiencing. So we try to use these goals in every day of our lives and we try to understand people based on who they are and what they're trying to be and who they used to be in predicting what's going to happen in the future so that we can help them to live a better life and to improve their overall quality of life. So psychology is concerned with the following, say for example, we're concerned with how individuals develop and mature at different stages of life. That is one of our key contributions. We, we speak about the different the changes that happens with a person as he or she matures. And those changes can be psychological, cognitive, emotional, and sometimes even physical. Okay? And we take these things into account because we have clients from various stages of life and our approach should change depending on the life stage of that client. See, for example, a client in his 30s is different from a client in his or her late teen, um, late adolescence because a client in his 30s is more likely to be bothered with work while a client in adolescence is more likely to be bothered with schooling, okay? And we try to help people deal with various stressors of life, various challenges by being knowledgeable about the different challenges that occur at different stages of life. Later on, you will have an example where we'll talk about childhood. Next is that we're also concerned about cognitive concepts such as consciousness, memory, and reasoning. And we try to explain, um, we try to explain different problems related to this. Say, for example, those who are in late adulthood may experience a decline in memory, okay? And we try to intervene, we try to refer them to mental health professionals, say for example, psychiatrists, who can give them interventions in order to mitigate the negative effects of a declining memory. The next is also what we call reasoning. So we try to understand how do different, uh, how do we differ? When it comes to reasoning capability, why is it that it's easier to explain to an adult than to a child? Okay, we also we're also concerned with how the individual and his environment shape his personality. This is a very important concept in psychology. So we believe that you are not the only one shaping your own personality, but your immediate environment also contribute in how you shape your personality because sometimes. You're not the one who wanted to adapt a certain behavior, but rather you have a certain attitude or behavior because of the influence of the people around you. Okay? What if you believe that people are good human beings and people are going to help, but because of your recent experiences, you believe that people are not trustworthy? Okay? What if you're really a very kind boy or girl? But because of your family problems, you became a cold-hearted individual, okay? You believe that everyone will try to, you know, they can try to trick you or fool you. That's because of the influence of your immediate environment to you, okay? That's why it's important, especially in the Filipino context, when we deal with clients, the person is not our only client. We also consider the family as a client okay because if the person experiences a certain problem we believe that especially in the filipino setting that the person itself or the person himself is not the problem but rather what the person is feeling is a symptom of a greater problem occurring in the family okay and that is their way of asking for help we are also concerned with how we think behave and feel in certain situations because these are connected to each other. How you think will change the way you behave 
and it will change the way you feel. Okay, say for example, what if you're nervous about exams? Then you will you will think that you're not going to do well and your, your behavior is that you're going to be very anxious during the day of your exam. That's why we teach people how to handle their emotions. Like it's normal to feel bad after a negative event. It's normal to be sad and there's nothing wrong about it so that you will not think that you are not normal. You will, but rather you would think that it's perfectly normal to have these feelings and to have these thoughts but we're going to do our best to help you control these thoughts these emotions so that your behavior will be helpful and productive we're also concerned with mental health and mental illnesses but we're not just concerned with what's wrong with the person we're also concerned with what can be enhanced what can what can we work with to give the person a better quality of life we're concerned with things such as the strengths of the person coping how can he or she cope with the problems that he or she is experiencing and we're also concerned with concepts such as happiness and psychological well-being okay so what i'm saying to you is that psychology is a very diverse field and we are not limited to mental health and mental illness but rather there are various subfields in psychology that is concerned with various um, psychological concepts, psychological constructs that we may observe or um, we may that manifest in our day-to-day -day lives. The first perspective we're going to talk about is the theory of cognitive development and this was theorized by John Piaget. Okay, so the theory of cognitive development deals with the nature of knowledge itself and how humans come to acquire it. Okay, so Piaget focuses work among children and he believes that children made sense of the world in a different way compared to adults. This is not to say that children are inferior to adults but rather he believes that children things in a different manner compared to adults and he focused on how does and how do children develop cognitively in the early stages of life and he came up with a four stage model of how the mind processes the information encountered so let's take a look at those stages in the next few slides First, we need to familiarize ourselves with the basic concepts of cognitive to the theory of cognitive development the first thing I want to share with you is the concept of schema and when we say schema, these are the building blocks of knowledge and schemas are mental organizations that individuals use to understand their environment and when we say schema, these are beliefs, these are ideas, these are thoughts, sometimes they are automatic, sometimes they're easily accessible. Say for example, if if your parents raise you well, then you're going to believe that your schema about parents is that parents are good, okay? If you encountered strangers who tried to trick you or who tried to fool you, who tried to steal from you, you're going to have a schema that strangers are bad, okay? If, if you have a good time at school, then your schema is that, your idea about schooling is that schooling is fun. Okay, learning is fun so you have a lot of schema about things and we try to organize these different schemas that we have in a meaningful manner however sometimes our schemas once they are formed it would be difficult to change them especially if you have negative or bad schemas say for example people may have negative attitudes towards um, a certain gender a certain race a certain skin color okay a certain profession or mental illness so it's hard to change your schema about mental illness because it has been formed for quite some time okay in order for you to be healthy you must learn adaptation or changing the way we think to meet the demand of the situation okay sometimes situations will challenge our schemas and we need to adapt the way we think so that we'll be able to deal with the demands of the situations. Okay, 
and later on we're going to talk about the stages of cognitive development which reflects the increasing sophistication of how the child's um, thought of the child's thought processes okay now PJ is also known for these two important concepts the concept of assimilation and the concept of accommodation so whenever you encounter information you try to assimilate or accommodate them so what's the difference when we say assimilation you try to apply previous concepts to new concepts say for example if you saw when you were a child you saw a four-legged animal and your parent told you that that is a dog then you went to the zoo and you saw a tiger because the tiger is four-legged you assimilated that with what you know so far and you said that that is a dog but in reality that is a tiger so there's a danger with assimilation because when we assimilate it may not be accurate okay that's when we accommodate okay later i'm going to discuss accommodation here's one more example of assimilation perhaps when you were a child you believed that if things have wings they can fly say for example birds can fly because they have wings now when i was a child when i was watching superheroes on screen i once believed that they can fly because of their cape because in my mind their cape is their wing okay but eventually i realized that one cannot fly simply by wearing a cape on their back okay so that's one more example of assimilation say for example thinking or believing that chickens can also fly like birds okay you're assimilating what your the new information to what you know so far you must learn how to accommodate as well so when you learn how to accommodate when you accommodate your schemas are being challenged that's why when you're accommodating you're now replacing you're now changing the old information you're now changing the way you think to fit in the new concepts okay and that is what accommodation is so parents will play a very important role in accommodation so that your children will not think that all four-legged animals are dogs okay you're going to correct them ahead of um early so that they will know that there are four-legged animals but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are dogs so challenge their ideas so that their thinking will adapt as well okay so that is it for assimilation and accommodation with assimilation you try to fit in the new information with what you know so far with accommodation, you try to change the way you think or you try to correct something so that your thinking or your thought process would adapt. Okay, so you know that you have already achieved accommodation when you no longer believe that chickens can fly just like birds. Okay, so that's one example. Try to think of your own example as well. Now let's take a look at the actual stages of cognitive development that PJ shared to us. So the first stage is what we call sensory motor stage and this happens around 0 to 2 years old and in sensory motor stage we get knowledge through senses because we don't have prior experience yet, we don't have an existing knowledge about how things work we try to learn through first-hand experience okay so you, you don't know yet how a candy tastes like or how milk tastes like that's why you learn by actually tasting it okay but eventually you already know how it tastes like and you proceed to the latter stages but in sensory motor you have to learn by experiencing something okay so in sensory motor stage one of the most important things that we can achieve is what we call object permanence and this is developed around four to nine months okay so let me show you an example of object permanence so when we say object permanence that is the ability to realize that objects exist when they are not being sensed okay and a younger child someone who is not yet four months old will not have object permanence yet and they would think that if you hide something from them it is now non-existent or it doesn't exist anymore 
But as you grow older, you realize that even though this bear or, um, I don't know if this is a bear or a dog based on its appearance, but even though this stuffed toy is hidden from the child, he knows that it still exists. Okay, and he will validate the existence of this toy by reaching behind the wall that is in between them. Okay, so that's the importance of object permanence. Here's one example. When you are a child, you played peekaboo with your parents. Even though their face is hidden from you, you still know that they're, they continue to exist. Okay, it doesn't mean that if your parent is in another room, they don't exist anymore. They are just there, but you can you just can't see them. Okay, that's the importance of object permanence. Knowing that things exist even though you can't see them or you can't hear them. Okay, so now let's move on to the next stage, which is the pre-operational stage, which is in the um, two to five years old. And in this stage, we now we are now able of verbal thinking, but sometimes our thinking is egocentric. Later, I'm going to show you an example, and we can now do mentally what we can only do physically before. For example, before. When you were in sensory motor, you learned that if you drop a glass from the table, then it would shatter. So that's how you learn that things can shatter or things can break. When you're in the pre-operational stage, you, lo you no longer have to shatter or to drop a glass for you to know that it will break. Okay, so if you ask a child from 2 to 5 years old, ask them something like, What would happen if I drop the glass from the table? They might be able to answer that because now they can do things or imagine things instead of physically learning how something happens. Okay? So they would know that if you push a toy, it would move forward or it would move to the direction that you're pushing a toy towards. Right? Um, the, um, to where you're pushing the certain toy. Okay? And in this stage, it's also important that to know that we are not yet capable of what we call conservation. So, I'm going to show you an example of conservation. Okay, so in this stage, in the pre-operational stage, we can exhibit what we call animistic thinking or we believe that inanimate objects are alive. See, for example, children will typically say that when they're walking, the sun is walking with them. That's why their shadows are moving. Okay, children engage in pretend play with stuffed toys because of animistic thinking. Okay, this is not to say that they are not developing well, but that's just how they see things. The next is what we call egocentrism. Okay, when we say egocentrism, the ego is the self. Centrism means how do you center your thinking or where does your thinking revolve on? Okay, so with, when we say egocentrism, your thinking revolves around you, okay? You, you do not have the capability yet to see things from the perspective of another person. In this stage, in pre-operational stage, one exercise done with children is this. Typically, a child sits across a stuffed toy, and then this is the three mountain task, and then a teacher or a parent is going to ask a child in this exercise the teacher is going to ask a child how do you think the doll can see the mountains from his or her perspective and then you're going to have choices so the correct answer is from the perspective of the doll the doll can see the mountains as from smallest to largest and from your perspective it's going to be from largest to smallest you know what? You can do that because you're now adults. But from the perspective of from the perspective of children, even though they are go they are being asked about the perspective of the doll, what they say is that the doll will see the mountains from largest to smallest. Hence, what I'm trying to say here is that they don't have the capacity yet to consider the perspective of another person. Okay? So they are, this is not to say that they are selfish, but rather, they do not have the ability yet to consider how other people think and feel, okay? 
Next, let's talk about conservation. And if you are still in the pre-operational stage, you are not yet capable of conservation. You become capable of conservation in the concrete operational. Okay? So, when we say conservation, that is the recognition that when object properties change, other, pers other properties remain the same. So, in layman's term, here's one example. If we change the shape of the object, you still know that its volume remain the same. Okay? So, let's take a look at this example. First, let's take a look at conservation of liquid. So, look at these containers. In this example, the liquid from the right container was transferred into a smaller, wider container. And then, let's ask the child. Which of the two has more liquid? Typically, the child will still choose the taller container because they think that if a container is taller, then it has more. But not necessarily. Okay? That's for conservation of liquid. Next, let's talk about conservation of mass. If you try to squeeze the clay or the dough into a flatter figure, they would say that the one on the right is bigger or they would say that it's heavier because it's bigger they don't know that even though we have squeezed the dough on the left it still weighs the same as the one on the right so they're not yet capable of of analyzing such things now let's take a look at coins okay so look at this now we have some coins here that are colored bronze and we have some coins here at the bottom so the question is are there still as many um, pennies as nickels or more of one than the other okay so if if we show it to a child in this manner say for example these smaller coins we group them together to the point that there's no distance between them they're going to say that there are more um the they would choose the one in the bottom over the one in the top. They would say that they would prefer this one over this one because the one in the bottom seems um, to be more compared to the one in the top. Or they would another approach is that they would say that the one in the bottom looks bigger. Hence, they are worth more compared to the coins at the top. Okay? So, that's the way they see things. Another thing is the conservation of length. So if you bend a line, they might think that it's becoming shorter. Or here's one more example for conservation of length. If I move a pencil, now they are not they are not placed in the same spot. They would think that this one is longer than this one. Okay? So that's just the way that a child in the pre-operational stage will see things. It doesn't mean that they are inferior. It's important for us to recognize that there are limitations in the way that they see things, okay? Eventually, you will move to what we call the concrete operational stage, and let's take a look at that. In the concrete operational stage, it's now possible to conserve shapes, numbers, and, and liquid, okay? And that's one of the most important achievements when you are in 6 to 11 years of age, okay? And in this stage, you learn initially how to use logic and reasoning, but it's still limited to appearance and what is concretely observed. That's why it's called concrete operational. Sometimes your reasoning is limited to what you can see, and you don't believe in abstract representation. Say, for example, children will not believe that a mascot is not really a mascot, but rather a mascot is not really, really alive, but rather there's a person inside the mascot they won't believe you because they think that their favorite character is really alive because they cannot see the person inside the mascot okay so it's one way to entertain um children or those in grade school okay eventually they will no longer be entertained by that because they will move on to the formal operational stage wherein they're capable of abstract thinking Okay, and they're capable of systematic problem solving, they're capable of metacognition, meaning you can now reflect and think about what you are thinking, 
Okay, that's metacognition. Thinking about what you think. You can now critique what you think. You can now reflect on it. And that's one important achievement as a 12-year-old, as an adolescent. Okay? That's why adolescents are more reasonable. They are more empathic. They are more abstract in the way that they think. And you are now capable of scientific reasoning. That's why as much as possible, we try to avoid talking about research when talking with children. Okay, so those that's for the cognitive stages of cognitive stages of development according to John Piaget. And in the next topics, we're going to talk about personality development from different psychologists.